And welcome in to another episode of Tiger Territory, part of the Foul Territory Network, a Detroit Tigers podcast. I'm Kieran Steckley. With me, as always, is a man who completely fills out the box on his ballot every single time with perfection. He is Cody Stavenhagen. How are you doing? Doing good, Kieran. I'm pretty fired about my pick for Oakland County Water Commissioner. So, Ooh. yeah, did my did my civic duty to vote. We, we encourage everyone else to go out there and vote here in the next couple of days. Yeah, and if you have already, kudos to you. And if you're waiting until Election Day, that's awesome, too. That's what I'll be doing. Uh, and uh, over the years, living out of state, blah, 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 I voted pretty much every single way there is to vote. So, uh, so yeah, it's always always a fun deal, always a fun deal. You know, I actually – I did have a, a weird thought. I was like, do you think, like, if you, Cody, like – because I'm thinking of it from Scott Harris's perspective. Like, if there was a Stavenhagen running for president, regardless of what the politics were, would you, like, maybe, like, try to get a sign or something or, like, a T-shirt? Because, it like, I don't know, Steckley for president, Stavenhagen for president. Maybe it will be you one day. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I was like, this Scott Harris, like, I don't know what his politics are, but like, you know, Harris for president thing, like that's, a, that's it's cool to have your name for president. I don't know. Oh uh, yeah. I think it'd be best if like it were an obscure independent candidate that no one's going to remember <laughs> exists in like 12 years. Then you can just break out like, Hey, look at this cool sign I have, you know, I think that would uh, work best. Yeah. I mean, I'm, um, I'm a, I, I, I'm a sucker for the kind of memorabilia stuff. Obviously, I love memorabilia, politics included. Like, I got Joe Biden stickers and Ted Cruz signs in my garage because they gave them to me, and I'll always accept them. And I voted for neither one of them. So, like, so there you go. Like, it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's like a little memento from the times. You know what I mean? So, I, I appreciate it. Maybe I'll pick up something on Tuesday. Uh, all, right. all right. For those trying to kin- uh, pin down Kieran's politics, you're even more confused than ever. Here we go. <laughs> Gotta keep them guessing. Uh, so let's let, let's go back to the World Series as we have uh, a handful, you know, handful of times here on the on the podcast. And I'll, I'll tell you what, there was a time. I'm just going to go to that fifth inning uh, in, in Game Five because <laughs> I. I, I, as it was unraveling, I was like, man, I, I've, I've kind of seen this movie before. Now, obviously nothing with the stakes of a world series, but I've kind of seen like a team just kind of completely unravel. If you've been a Tigers fan in the past decade, plus you, you've experienced it, obviously nothing to that scale. Um, like Aaron judge is not going to, it's like, I always talk about the randomness of the game. Like Aaron Judge is not dropping that ball. He probably hasn't dropped that ball since he was a teenager. He's probably not going to drop another one like that the rest of his career. You know, sometimes things happen. And then, like, you've made this reference before, Cody, about, like, JV baseball coaches just, like, running these drills, like, into <laughs> into guys' heads. Like, the the Rizzo, Cole play. Well, like, oh, you think you're too good for this? Remember yeah, the World Series? World next, yeah. You know? So, uh, so yeah, just – you know, congratulations to the Dodgers. I thought the Yankees would put up a better showing, even though I think it was a more competitive series than your typical five gamer. Um, but you know, and congrats to Jack Flaherty. Uh, it looked like he had a good time at the celebration. So, uh, any any thoughts on on the Fall Classic as we wrap up the 2024 season and can officially move forward with the 2025 season? Uh, man, shout out to Jack Flaherty for his turn up in the the parade. I mean legend i think my respect for him just went up big time <laughs> uh yeah the yankees were maddening to watch man in a way it a confirmed my thought that maybe there's a world where which bo brisky locates his game fast game four fastball up in a way and the tigers face the yankees and who's to say they couldn't have hung with that team because the yankees leave a lot of meat on the bone and obviously that got exposed against a good team like the Dodgers kind of makes you appreciate the way the Tigers played in the final two months of the season where they're just playing such clean baseball, taking advantage of, of the things as the Tigers like to say on the margins, running the bases, playing good defense. So now imagine you add some talent to this Tigers roster if you're able to continue to do the small things so well because this team had no choice but to do the small things well this past season, like then you could have a pretty interesting product and the Dodgers are a great example of that. They run the bases really well. They, for the most part, are a pretty good defensive team. They put a lot of pressure on the Yankees, force the Yankees to execute for the majority of that series. And then obviously now you look back and it's like, Oh yeah, they won, they won that easily. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, in regards to 
like I, I, I was listening to like reactionary stuff from the New York media and you know, Aaron Boone and Cashman aren't very popular. They haven't been for years. Obviously, there's not going to be any major moves there after, you know, reaching the World Series. But they always say these things like these: the poor fundamental play is a reflection of, you know, the coaching staff, which is headed by the manager, obviously. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. They go down this rabbit hole of thought that, like, if, as a Tigers fan, if you're looking for another thing that kind of have a feather in your cap is that no one's ever really going to talk about your team that way like no one's gonna accuse the tigers of not being well coached you know i think people are accusing them of that the entire first half of the season but <laughs> well well yes and then yeah wasn't too long ago we had to have you know aj hinch weird conversations uh be yeah. thankful be thankful he's there uh but but yeah and there's this postseason kind of taught me that there's multiple ways to to win, and that's you know postseason as a whole. Multiple ways to uh, I don't want to use the phrase skin a cat, but you know the phrase multiple ways to skin a cat, and uh, and so like it gives me I felt better about the game coming out of this postseason than I did going in. So that that's a great thing uh, all around. And real, real quick too on this, like Judge is getting creamed. I know like he. You know, he had the home run and all that stuff. But for the entirety of the postseason, he's kind of been like the poster child of like, what's wrong? Is he going to be the next Don Mattingly who didn't really play, didn't play in the playoffs to have a bad playoff reputation? But some some people in New York are calling him Mr. June after Dave Winfield was Mr. May. (laughs) Uh, So I'm kind of curious, your perspective generally, are you one of those people that adheres to the thought and not necessarily specific to judge, but like, is there a such thing as like someone doesn't perform in the playoffs or is it more or less like, like basically is someone a choker or not? Basically your philosophy on that. Cause that's kind of like an old school thing to go by. It's not really like a data driven uh, yeah. approach, you know, as which is what we do now in baseball more so, but like sometimes people just don't have it in those key moments. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not like a huge believer in that, but sometimes there is something to like certain people are built for the moment better than others. Like, I think we've seen that, like, you know, as much as clutch gene isn't supposed to be a real thing in baseball, like, I don't know. David Ortiz was pretty good at coming through in big moments in the postseason, you know? So like, is there something to that? Sure. I don't think this means that Aaron Judge, Aaron Judge is weak or he's a choker or, you know, Alex Rodriguez got panned for years for not performing in the playoffs in New York. And and he actually had some okay playoff performances that were just kind of overshadowed by the negativity. Um, you know, you can point to the small sample sizes or whatever. Judge obviously struggled in the postseason, but he also had a couple of big homers. He had a homer off class A that Yankees might not be in the World Series if if he and John Carlo don't go back to back off the best closer in the game, you know, and then you look at the other side, no one's really talking about how bad Shohei Otani was in the World Series. And granted, the last couple games he was playing through a shoulder injury, but Shohei Otani did not perform in the World Series, but his team won. So he's kind of not, you know, those same questions aren't being applied to him. So in, in some ways, I think it's a little bit of an overblown narrative that, you know, when you start watching baseball like it's a football game because it's the playoffs and every game matters, like the perspective can easily get skewed. Do you have a strong stance on or response or responsibility pie chart for uh, the Cole and and Rizzo play? Uh, because I kind of thought I kind of went more like Cole's got to try to get there, but I kind of thought it was a little bit of a like Rizzo. I thought should have been more aggressive and taking momentum toward the plate or excuse me toward the base. Because he, regardless, that's like the better move to do in anticipation of something that could happen. That's Mookie Betts right there. That's not a slow runner. Um, but I, I, but but Cole's also got to go to the back. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty aboard to criticize Garrett Cole for that uh, that play train. You know, I saw Cole's comments after the game mentioning like the spin of the ball and how weird it was hit, and I was like. Why, what does that have to do with you not being on first base? Like, I mean, Garrett Cole is an ultimate competitor, so I don't want to use the word excuse, but I was kind of, I, I, I didn't love like how he addressed the play after the game. I just think he's got to be at first base or at least making an effort to be at first base instead of standing still. The last thing you can be doing in that situation when Mookie Betts is busting down the line is standing still and pointing at your first baseman. Oh, go, go get the bag. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty bad look. Yeah, it is a bad look. There's no doubt about that. But uh, 
But yeah, so everybody keep up with the fundamentals. That that would be that that would be a lesson. <laughs> that would be a lesson from that game. Even the uh, you know the Volpe play, just a tough play, but still a fundamental aspect to that. So go ahead and say congratulations to the Dodgers and uh, and. We'll see what happens in the Flaherty sweepstakes. What a year for him. What a year for Flaherty. Congrats to Flaherty again because I didn't know if he was going to be a starter ever again. Pitches at near all-star level, gets traded, wins a World Series, and he's a free agent again. So uh, could not have been scripted better for your boy Jack there. Uh, All right, let's move on to another topic. A couple minutes here, Cody. Uh, We mentioned the election earlier. And I started thinking, I was like, you know, the Tigers have a pretty, like, you know, a, an amazing storyline of a former player and Jim Bunning, who was a Hall of Fame pitcher and then went on to be a senator. I believe it was a senator. And, like, if you're a senator, then I think you're at least partially qualified just in general on the resume to, like, be president or, like, run for president, be considered for president, I would say. Not necessarily be president, but be considered for president. So I was like, I don't know, is there... Yeah, what it would have been like when he first went to politics to be like, oh yeah, Jim Bunning, the guy who like you know saw him throw a no hitter or whatever. So like, is there anybody on this team that you deem presidential? This current Tigers team, because you know, speaking of you know Flaherty, who was a union rep, that's a leadership, right? Uh, you know, that's that's something that you know to be taken into consideration. I was like, you know, it seems like everybody loves Jay Hen. Yeah, it seems like he's 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 a guy that you know everyone just kind of like has good feelings with, and a lot of times these elections are feelings based. You know what I mean? And uh, so that was something there. Like Matt Vierling's got movie star and politician good looks. There's no there's no doubt about that. And you know someone as kind of like a deep thinker as like a Casey Mize, like kind of came to mind a little bit. Someone who you could tell like really processes like every move he makes. You know and uh, and so, so yeah, I was, I was, you know, those are just some names. There's some names there. You, do you have any, uh, you, you're, you interact with these guys, you see them cameras on cameras off, uh, any kind of tigers that you think, you know, that a little bit of a presidential vibe there. Uh, well, my, na- my mind naturally goes to when the tigers first hired their manager and I called his, uh, the best man in his wedding, Brody Van Wagen. And I said, what, what do you think the first time you met AJ Hinch? And he said, presidential. AJ's got the presidential vibe a little bit, can handle himself in front of a camera, can kind of always say and do the right thing, knows how to manage people. Uh, that's that's a pretty natural choice right there, obviously, leadership experience. If we're going players, yeah, I, I think you nailed it. Um, Jay Hen, man, he's got the great charisma. Matt Veerling, he's, he's even Catholic. He could be a Kennedy or at least <laughs> went, went to Notre Dame. Um, I feel like I'm – Destin somehow get in trouble if we speculate too much about like politics or religion in here. So uh, <laughs> ch- trying to think if there's anyone, you know, we're overlooking Casey Mize definitely has kind of the right politician level of polish. Uh, but I don't know. It's 2024. All, all bets are off. What's not to say Jake Rogers <laughs> can't be president. There you go. Jake Rogers. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a mustache president, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe he can, uh, he can, he can bring that back. So, uh, so yeah, it's, you know, I, I I did like that you brought up uh, AJ there because you know there's also the education element went to Stanford you know ever mm-hmm. ever heard of it uh, represented the United States of America as well uh, during his playing days and uh, and obviously knows how to handle people I was admit when I thought about AJ Hinch I was imagining like him getting heated in like a cabinet meeting. At, the only example of what I could use is like maybe when he's arguing with an umpire, you know what I mean? Like, so, so like how would he be when someone screws up in, you know, you know, one of the departments or whatever. So I, I'm sure he would be very, I mean, he's presidential now. Like he, so like it, it's a, it's a natural fit there. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it'd be, it's always interesting. There's more and more of these guys getting into politics now. So it's as funny and hokey as this segment is. It's really not out of the realm of possibility, though. Somebody tries to run for governor or something, you know. So yeah, I don't. Just after this segment, I think I'm ready for the hot stove to begin heating up. <laughs> uh, I don't know why we just spent like three minutes on that, but hopefully, a couple people got got some laughs out of it, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. And if you got a uh, suggestion or an idea, sh- shoot us on uh, X. Cody's at Cody Stavenhagen. I'm at Kieran underscore Steckley. Pod page is at Tiger Territory underscore. Before we move on, we have ourselves in advertisement. So please stay tuned with uh, for a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. If you're looking for that fresh barbershop shave at home, introducing Manscaped's newest innovation, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code FAL20 for 20% off plus free shipping. I've had so many bad razors in my past and you only get one face. Make it count with the latest tech in face electric shavers. I'm talking flex adjust technology, which makes sure the blades and pivoting head adapt to the unique contours of your face and neck to hit all the angles. There's a travel lock so you don't hear buzzing in your bag from an accidental on button situation. And the Chairman Pro also features an LED spotlight to help you see every detail. Get the Chairman Pro today and experience a shave that is smooth as a baby's butt. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FAL20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FAL20 at manscaped.com. Remember the code's FOUL20, thanks to AJ Pierzynski and Scott Braun, our colleagues here at FOUL Territory, for the word for Manscaped. Yeah, and you can tell they enjoyed doing that ad. I, I feel compelled to, to, to use that code myself. So, uh, all right, let's move on to a guy that we haven't talked about in a, in a long time, Mr. Cody. Matt Manning, sort of a... Sort of a, a favorite topic of the podcast. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, the what's up with Matt Manning? What's the deal with Matt Manning? Uh, always good uh, filler when you're trying to figure out the future of this team. And, and now the question's a little bit different. So we didn't see him. How many games did he play? He played, he pitched, he made five starts. Did you really think that even when, when he like lost the back end rotation job, that he would make just five starts uh, in the in the big leagues in in 2024 because that number, I mean, it makes sense when you recall, but like, there's no way we were like, pitchers get hurt, he's gonna be here a lot, and he was literally just a spot starter for the Tigers, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, thoughts on Matt Manning? Yeah, kind of strange to look back on his year. He actually had a really good spring training, lost in a very uh, heated competition, you know, losing that spot to Casey Mize and Reese Olsen. But I definitely thought he would have made more than five starts or thrown more innings than he did, especially when you consider he was basically serving as a de facto sixth starter there early in the year. The Tigers kept having rainouts and he kept getting the call. It seemed like one week after another. And those first couple outings, he threw pretty well. Now, as the year went on, things weren't so good, and he he struggled a little bit in Toledo, and the stuff wasn't there, and he just could not. You know, similar things we've seen, the velo, the the breaking ball, looking for the second shape with his breaking ball. Uh, A little bit of a frustrating year. I think he battled some minor health issues toward the end of the season. And so it does kind of leave him, it would seem like, out of the rotation discussion entering a new year. This is a guy who was one of the tent poles of this initial rebuild it was supposed to be. And now he's been in this organization a long time. He's never really turned the corner like you would hope. Uh, how long have I been saying Matt Manning to the bullpen? Makes a lot of sense. I was saying it privately even before I started saying it publicly. I don't know for sure if that's the plan, but it would sure seem like that has to be the plan. And I'll just reiterate why I think it's a great idea. Here's a guy whose fastball velocity has always fluctuated, been up and down. We've seen this guy throw upper 90s, and we've also seen him throw like 92. Let him come out of the pin. Let him just rip it. You know, max effort fastball. Throw as many fastballs as you want. You're not going to see these hitters a second time. We know the fastball can be an effective pitch at the major league level. It has been, and the numbers back that up. The inconsistencies with the breaking ball, still a little bit of a concern, but you don't need that third pitch. You don't really need to mess around with the changeup or maybe even kind of the slider and the sweeper. Uh, Go rip your slider as hard as you want or go throw a big looping sweeper. Just throw your best breaking ball. Keep that in your back pocket. You can live off your fastball. 
I think there's still a world in which Matt Manning could become a really effective relief pitcher um, if the Tigers are willing to make that move and if Matt Manning himself is willing to embrace that and not let his ego go in the way of what could end up being a really good career transition for him. Yeah, I mean, you just look at the numbers. You know, fun fact, randomly, you know, in those five stars, four were against National League teams. Like, he, he pitched against mm-hmm. Minnesota, and that was it from the junior circuit. Uh, you know, he he got into the sixth inning, the majority of, of these uh, starts. He went six and two-thirds on April 17th against the said Twins. You look at the strikeouts, he had three in the first outing, but seven, seven, five, and then you know, kind of all she wrote there with the with the one punch out against Arizona, and he hadn't pitched. He never got back to the major leagues after May nineteenth. Wow. Like talk talk about just sort of like I don't want to say out of sight, out of mind, but like it, this was a major league operation that was rolling, like moving on from. Yeah, using when it's, the Tigers, I think they had another spot start opportunity, and they called up Cater Montero for his debut instead of Matt Manning, and that kind of told you what you needed to know. And about how the organization viewed Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stuck with Montero. So, mm-hmm. like, I mean, it it has to be one of those deals where he's just not – I mean, uh, pure speculation on my part, so I'm not, like, reporting anything. But he's just not taking or making the adjustments that are being asked of him. And so, therefore, like, he, you have to work those out in AAA because there was obviously – I mean, bullpen days, anybody? There was obviously opportunities <laughs> – for Matt Manning to start games for the Tigers post trade deadline, you know, and, and we just didn't, the, the operation just kind of kept moving on without him. I think it would be, I think it would be great if he were to, tr- you know, go with this like reliever route, because he just seems like a, f- I know it's an ego thing, like you said, and the failed starter, you know, t-shirt joke or whatever. But if he just kind of comes out and throws gas, because some of those starts you could tell he knew he was like, my job is to come here and just like, and just like throw gas, like use it, get as many innings as possible, save the bullpen. Uh, you know, there's you know, quote unquote, like no tomorrow or whatever. You know what I mean? So just like go, and and that that's a role that he can be a valuable asset to a team for, and that and and at a certain point. You know, he's look, where is he? At? He's he's gonna turn 27. He's gonna be 27 by the time he reports for spring training. Wow. Like he's not a he's not really a pup anymore. So no. so like at a certain point, like this is your route, dude, in my opinion. And I think like other or I'm sure if he were to become available in some fashion, like other organizations would be interested. Uh, but at the same time, like if I was I don't know, like the Angels or something. I'd be like, well, they couldn't get the the most out of him over in Detroit with that coach, with that manager, with those, you know, guys in the front office, that coaching staff in the minors. Like, do we have the confidence we're going to be able to do that? Like, you better be really sure. So, I, the Tigers are more entertaining when Matt Manning is in his six foot six self is on the mound and. And you know, throwing the slider, throwing gas, you know, his little kind of, oh know, yeah, you know what I mean. So like, I, I would love to see him on the team, but the team situation has for sure passed his development arc by. I think is a fair way to put it. Yeah, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. This uh, it would seem like a make or break year for Manning coming up in the Tigers organization, and you would think that's going to have to require some level of evolution. Yeah. All right, uh, real quick here, Cody. Um, I, I I've mentioned this probably every episode, but it's one of those things that like I just my mind keeps going there, so I want to keep talking about it. Like if we were to, we're not gonna do this right now, but like eventually this off season, we're probably gonna do something called like, are we sure? Like, are we sure X? Uh, and one of them is gonna be Dylan Dingler. So I actually looked this up uh, because I was like, how important is Dingler? potentially for next year. So Carson Kelly obviously traded for a couple of years ago and, and, and kept on before being traded this past year, Carson Kelly, how many games did he play? Let's see. I was looking this up. Carson Kelly played in. Now this is not starts, but he played in 60 games. He had 203 plate appearances. 
that's and for you know, we'll say half the season. You know what I mean? Like that, that that's not nothing. Like that's that and again, that's not all starts. Some of that's you know, some pinch hit stuff, bro, you know, come in for an inning after Rogers gets, you know, pinch hit for, you know, whatever. So like it I'm not saying he started 60 games, but he was a valuable member of that team and a reliable member of the team while he was here. That's why he was able to be traded for to a team that still had World Series operate, uh, aspirations, right? Texas Rangers. So the Dingler thing, that's – oh, man, now I got to say a stupid pun. That's – Dingler is dangling over my mind, like, a, a lot because I'm like, uh, I hope, but, like, in terms of anxiety level – about whether it could work i think it's kind of high i think it's kind of high because we just don't have as much evidence of like that role and we talked about it before but i was, I went and looked up how much carson kelly was used and i was like yeah i i like that we're bringing this up a second time already in the off season because it does feel a little bit like mm, parker meadows at the start of last year like he was everyone's just like oh he'll be the center fielder i was kind of like eh, are we sure and obviously Parker had to go get sent down and now we're entering spring feeling great about Parker again, but this is very much Dylan Diggler or whoever is the Tigers backup catcher is going to have to play a substantial amount. It's not to mention the fact the Tigers went all last season without any injuries for any with either Jake, Jake Rogers or Carson Kelly or Dylan Dingler. That just doesn't happen at the catcher position very often. So whoever's your number two and assuming it's going to be Dingler, like there is some responsibility uh, you can't walk into that and hit one. I mean, maybe you can at the catcher position hit 150, but uh, <laughs> ideally you, you're going to want a little more production. You know, I think because you do have someone who in theory is in a pretty established number one and Jake Rogers, a gold glove finalist, like that's, they can probably live with it if he's not really producing, but also given the volatility in Jake Rogers bat, it would be nice to have a little bit more of a sure thing. So like I said before, I'm sure they'll bring in someone else, whether it's probably, a, I would guess, a minor league deal, but they do have to have some sort of uh, backup plan in case Dingler just looks like a guy who needs a little bit more seasoning because he he certainly looked that way in the, the short sample we got of him in the big leagues this year. I think it's an underrated topic that could just become a big deal by you know late in spring training. Yeah, absolutely. And another... Um... Another example of, all right, you made the playoffs. It's no longer just kind of treading water time, like ascension time, and who will kind of be left, you know, in the dust, I guess, uh, potentially. Like that that stuff certainly exists. Uh, all right, real quick as we wrap up here, Cody, on a November Sunday. So uh, so we are officially into the off season with the World Series wrapping up. That means procedural things, and uh, and the most notable is on Monday, I believe. Monday, it's Monday coming Mon up. Monday, We're Tigers today, for those listening. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So uh, Tigers have some sixty dot sixty day IL uh, moves to make. That would be Sawyer Gibson Long, another guy. It's like man, I haven't thought about him in a while. Uh, Brendan White, Alex Fiedo. Obviously, those are three pitchers, and one Javier Baez. Yeah, we're going to see a little bit of roster movement here probably in the, in the next 24 hours. Those four guys have to either be placed back on the 60 or, you know, removed from the roster. Uh, Javi Baez, I know some of you guys aren't going to like this, but he's a lock. Sawyer Gibson Long, um, you know, he's recovering from injury. Tigers definitely want to keep him. Alex Fiedo, he's been a pretty productive player. Tigers are going to keep him. I think the interesting one is Brendan White. Brendan White. Um really struggled this year and then he was placed on the 60 day with a right elbow sprain um did he end up getting tommy john do we even know the answer to that look this up live have the uh producers check it here um i don't think he did am i wrong a right radial nerve injury that's right he had a hydro dissection procedure so a little bit tough to even know I would assume, you know, what his health status is. Uh, that kind of, it, it looks like he's expected to have a standard off-season strength and conditioning program. He threw a bullpen in September. So there's the latest one, Brendan White. He would seem like the guy the Tigers eh, probably not going to keep. I think in maybe another world, even a couple years ago, 
type of dude who could stay on the 40 man roster because it wasn't all that long ago. He was a little bit of a reliever on the rise, another late round pick, uh, 26 round pick. In fact, came out of nowhere, pitched well in the minors has really nasty stuff. A sweeper that averaged 2,800 RPM and has averaged even more than that. A good slider. His fastball doesn't get talked about a lot, but in his short big league stint in 2023, Opponents hit 162 against his fastball. So I think you would like to keep Brendan White in the organization, but I'm not sure given other moves you have to make, you can keep a 40-man spot for him. Uh, I have a hunch he's probably going to be removed from this roster here. And then kind of the question is, would someone else take a chance on him via waivers, especially given maybe a little bit of uncertainty about his health? I don't know, but uh, I, I, you know, I like Brendan White a lot. I think he has a lot of potential it was a difficult year for him, for sure. Um, even when he was pitching in the minor leagues, he just was not right. Um, did not have good numbers. He had a seven three six ERA, and well, he only threw eight games in the minors, seven innings. He was hurt most of the year, so I think that'll be kind of the, the more interesting one to both watch here on Monday and, and maybe follow going forward this off season. Happy early birthday to Brendan Y, who will turn twenty six on the eighteenth of this month. Mm. So. So there you go. So always got to bring up the age with these guys. It shapes, shapes, uh, shapes perspective uh, there for sure. Uh, all right. Want to make a little bit of announcement here. We will have a podcast as we have been doing uh, on Thursday morning, and it will be with one Jason Benetti, the Tigers TV voice, a very busy man. If you're a, uh, a fan of college and NFL football, as well as college basketball, uh, we might have to ask him, like, do you have any time to yourself? Uh, but obviously a great addition to the Tigers. And and one of those things that, like, in retrospect, like, kind of is like, oh, they made the playoffs that year and they also hired Jason Minetti. They kind of, like, rise at the same time, whereas in real time, it was those things uh, didn't seem like they were going to be uh, in lockstep, you know. So uh, Tigers fans, obviously, very lucky to have Jason and we are. Happy to be able to have him on. We we'll, we thank him for his time in advance. So, anything else, Cody? Before we jet out of here? No, I think that's it. Uh, we'll talk to you guys here in a couple of days. And yeah, very excited to have Jason on to reflect with his on his first year with the Tigers and much more. All right. Well, you can follow Cody on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Cody Statement Hagen. I am at Kieran underscore Steckley Pod Page at Tiger Territory underscore. We are also on YouTube, trying to grow that as much as possible. And we have links to all that stuff on our socials as well. So you, wherever you are, we are. And we thank you for listening. So for Cody Stavenhagen, I am Kieran Steckley. Everybody have a great week.